is the presence of the Holy Spirit in the day of Pentecost. And um, I, I want to lay some groundwork for you. Um, because it, it's important that we understand that Pentecost just didn't boom happen. Yes, it's a one-time event, but it's a one-time event set in the history of Christianity, set in the uh, history of the Jewish people, set in, in God's plan of salvation. And, and, and sometimes when we just pull it out and, and, and say, here it is, we forget everything that's going on around it. Okay? So understand that Pentecost means 50. And the celebration of Pentecost was actually happening among the Jewish people for hundreds of years before the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost. Okay? 50 days earlier, Jesus Christ had risen from the grave. It's only been seven weeks since we celebrated Easter. I know it seems longer than that, especially with this stay-at-home thing and, <laughs> and everything. Doesn't Easter seem a long way away? You know, but, but it's been seven weeks. And during that time, a lot has happened. A lot happened that first day when Jesus rose from the grave and from the tomb. He meets the disciples on the road to Emmaus. And he meets with the disciples in the uh, upper room, in, in the room, um, John's Gospel. And, and I think it's important, again, just trying to uh, give you some pictures. John's Gospel, Jesus appears to the, his disciples, John chapter 20. But it's interesting because he says this, verse 21, again Jesus said, Peace be with you, as the Father has sent, sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, listen to this, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins will be forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they will not be forgiven. What I want to emphasize there and what I want to point out to you is, uh, the Holy Spirit was working in the life of the disciples, of, I would say, the believers, before Pentecost. And when a person accepts Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit is working in their lives. But there's a big difference between the Holy Spirit being present in an individual's life and the Holy Spirit infilling an individual and being in complete control. And that's a large part about what we proclaim as a holiness people. That we not only have the joy of sins forgiven, but that we can live a Christ-like life because of God's Holy Spirit indwelling us day by day, moment by moment. Best example I've ever heard, and you may have a better one. If I say to you, come on into my house, make yourself at home. How many of you know I really don't want you to make yourself at home? I, I, I mean, come on. Do I want you to do the same things that you do in your house? And we won't talk about what those are. <laughs> you, you know, do I want you to go through all the closets and look at everything that's stacked and all my messes and all my piles? Do I want you to go into my dresser drawers and pull out everything? I mean, if it's your house, you do that, right? But when I say, come on in and make yourself at home, that's not what I mean. It means you're welcome to come in. You know, I'll be a good host. But there's a big difference if we really say, come in. My house is your house. When you're married and you move into one or the other person's home that's already been there, 
You look at everything. You get into everything. You, you, you discuss everything. And the difference between the presence of the Holy Spirit in our hearts and in our lives, guiding, directing, working our myths, and the Holy Spirit taking control of us, completely surrendering our lives to Him. The, what I say and what Scripture talks about, the infilling of the Holy Spirit. That's the difference between being a guest in a house and having ownership of the house. And what Pentecost is about is the difference between God being guest in our lives and him really having complete and total lordship of our hearts and our lives. And so, the whole, I say all that to just say, the Holy Spirit was working before Pentecost with the disciples and with the followers of Jesus. And Jesus was still working with the disciples Remember, he had said to them, it's important for you that I go away. He says, if I don't go away, you won't have the helper, the advocate, who is the Holy Spirit, who will, and then he gives us some guidelines of what the Holy Spirit does in the world and how it works in our lives today. Convicting of sin. Comforting in times of problems and difficulties. And so before Pentecost, that's what's happening. Jesus is kind of trying to teach the disciples what it's going to be when he's gone, but the Holy Spirit is still totally present in the world. But the Holy Spirit hasn't been given in his fullness yet until the day of Pentecost. And that's what's going on in these 50 days, if you will, in between the two, in between Christ's resurrection, and Pentecost. Forty days into it, there's what we have come to know as the ascension, Jesus ascending to heaven. And then there's the disciples waiting in the upper room, trying to figure out what all this is about, trying to figure out what's going on. And that brings us to Acts chapter 2. Story of the day of Pentecost. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Now, on that day, that day of Pentecost, as I said, the Jewish people already used it as a day of celebration. They actually used it to celebrate the giving of the law to Moses. That was to them the big thing going on. And so Jerusalem would have been as full as any time of the festivals of the holidays because Pentecost usually took place, just like now, in spring, late spring. It was an easy time to travel. It was a good time for people to come and gather together. So they would have been, the Jewish people would have been gathered in Jerusalem. All the nations would have been there. They would have been going to the temple, offering sacrifices. All that's going on. While that's happening, here's 120 people gathered together in an upper room. Again, trying to find out God's will and what they're supposed to do. Verse 2, suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, Aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, 
Pontus in Asia, Fergola and Pamphylia, Egypt and the pairs of Libya near Cyrene, parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what in the world does this mean? What's going on? What's happening? It's a good question. One we still need to ask today. Let me uh, give, I guess, one other aside to everything that's going on that day. And that is to simply say, and I think I've already stated it roundabout, I believe the disciples were already Christians before Pentecost. Were already followers of Jesus Christ. They had committed to following him for three years. They had been willing to give their lives for him. Uh, if you remember when Jesus blessed them in Luke's Gospel and sends them out, there's a group of 70 of them then. He sends them out and they do miracles, they cast out demons, they come back to Jesus. And they're all excited and they're saying, Jesus, this is what's happening. You know, miracles are being done, we're casting out demons. And Jesus talks about seeing Saint Paul. But he also says to them, he says, don't rejoice that you're doing miracles and casting out demons. Rejoice in this, that your name is written down in heaven. Now that almost sounds like believers to me, like those who are already following Jesus Christ. And, and if you think of what the disciples were doing at that time, they left off to follow Jesus. <laughs> they were doing miracles and, 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 and signs. You almost wonder what was left for God to do in their lives. Can I tell you, we would have thought that most of these guys were part of the church. If they were here today, we would have said, well, yeah, they're, they're Christians. They're completely devoted followers to Jesus Christ. And in fact, we would almost wonder what was left for God to do in their lives. And yet we know there was something. Because after Pentecost, they're different. After Pentecost, their lives are different. After Pentecost, there's the church, which did not exist before. So all of this is going on. And this group is gathered in the upper room praying, wondering what God's will is. He said to Terry, so they knew they were supposed to wait there. I imagine they had some interesting discussion in that time in the upper room. I imagine they remembered some of the things that had happened over the last three years. Do you remember when Jesus did and they talked about one of the miracles and one of the things that he had done? Do you remember when he called you and how he called you. I imagine they had those type of discussions. I imagine they talked about the Last Supper, their last evening with Jesus, and talked about the times where he broke the bread and gave them the cup. I imagine they talked about their failures also. I'm so sorry I did this, or I'm so sorry did that. And they were there gathering, waiting in obedience to God. The scripture tells us that as they were waiting, at just the right time in God's perfect plan of salvation and his complete plan of salvation, that they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And again, I suggest to you, this is different than when Jesus said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. For in this filling, we know that the Scripture talks about 
There were the winds, the mighty winds that rushed through the room and blew on all of them. There was the fire that fell on each one of them, separating them. And there was the one that we struggle with the most, the, the speaking in tongues. You probably already know what those represent, but let me remind you. The wind represents power. God's power. God knew that if the church was going to exist at all, it was not going to exist in man's power. <laughs> it was not going to exist because we decided, hey, there's going to be a church. It was going to exist because God put it in place. And he gave the power to build the church. Think about it. I don't think the disciples led anyone to a saving relationship of Jesus Christ with Jesus Christ before Pentecost. After Pentecost, it happened a lot. Oh, before Pentecost, there were some times they directed people to Jesus. But it was different again. But with the infilling of the Holy Spirit, there came a power to witness. A power to share Jesus Christ. That they did not have before. The second thing. The cloven tongues of fire. Whatever that looked like. And I'm sure it was interesting. <laughs> Somebody looked across at Peter and said, Hey Peter, you're a hothead. You know, Look at Paul. Or Paul wasn't there. Look at uh, one of the other disciples said, Oh, you're a hothead. James, John, you know. But the fire represents cleansing. And if you go through the Old Testament and even in other parts of the New Testament, fire always represented purity and cleansing. You see, not only does God want us to be forgiven of our sins, He wants us to be cleansed of our sinful nature. And we can talk about how that's done, because God's able to do it all at once. Boom, I have no doubt. But what I find in us is most of the time we're not willing to deal with both at the same time. When we come to Jesus Christ, and we know our lives are messed up, we ask for forgiveness of our sins. We're not thinking about having our whole nature just totally changed and being transformed and, and, and being made into new creatures in Christ Jesus. But as we grow and as we mature spiritually, there comes a time when God in His faithfulness tells us, hey, you know what? There's more I can do in your life if you'll let me. The question is just, are we willing? And the fire represented God's cleansing of the sinful nature, that which came because of the fall of Adam and Eve in the garden. That everyone has to deal with that the events that we've seen over these last couple of days, over this last week, they happen because of man's sinful nature. Can I tell you that man left to his own devices will do evil ultimately? Will ultimately think only of themselves? Will ultimately come to a point where greed is what's most important. And sin and the sinful nature will cause a police officer to do something that he shouldn't. And will cause people to react in ways that they should not and will cause us to question who's right and who's wrong. And 
and will cause racism and will cause hatred and will cause anything except the love of Christ. Which is what should be dwelling in our hearts by faith. You see, I believe from the depths of my heart that today more than ever, we need God's presence and the presence of His Holy Spirit in our world, in each and every individual. Because I think that's the only way the world's going to change. Right. And we can try all of our methodology. But until we start changing our hearts from the inside out, we're going to have to deal with the problem of sin in the world. We need not only God's empowering, we need His cleansing fire. <coughs> Which brings me to the third one, the speaking in tongues, and I don't want to get into a controversy issue on speaking in tongues and whether it's a language or whether it's an unknown language. <laughs> I do know this, that if I was to share the gospel with Kay, and Kay could not speak English, and I could not speak whatever language Kay spoke, say she spoke Spanish, and there was nobody else who was going to share the gospel with Kay, either the Lord could give me the ability to speak her language, or he could give Kay the ability to understand mine, or he might give us another language so that we could communicate, so that I could share the gospel. You see, I believe the importance of the speaking in tongues is that it is to tell us the gospel is for everybody. And that's why there is listed there all these nations who at times did anything but get along. <laughs> Just like our culture. But the thing is, because of the presence of the Holy Spirit, they all got to hear about the love of God. And that's what's going on at Pentecost. Wow! And the thing is, that's what's to be going on in the world today through the church. We are to be not only a group of believers who have been forgiven, but we are to be a group of believers who have surrendered our lives to God the Father, who have asked Jesus just to forgive us of our sins, but have allowed Him through His Holy Spirit to come in and just change us. The early church, the Christians, the thing that made them so different is that they literally believed they were different and new individuals. Christ living in them. Today I'm afraid sometimes we just think it's a program. Or we just think it's a set of rules. We don't think of it as a different life. That we are different creatures when God has filled us with His Holy Spirit. I think we're supposed to. And we don't do it in our own power, in our own mind. But we do it in His. Kind of interesting when you think about it. The Sermon on the Mount didn't change the disciples and get them out and witnessing and changing the world. The Ten Commandments didn't do it. No teaching so changed the disciples that they went out from the room and instead of being afraid, preach some of the most awesome messages. Just continue reading through Acts. As they shared the good news that Jesus Christ is the answer. Amen. It was Pentecost that changed. And we still need that fulfilling today. And praise the Lord we can have it. We can know not only that our sins are forgiven, but that His Holy Spirit infills, and as Paul would say later, and I love it, and Paul says, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. 
and the life that I live now, I live to the glory of God. I would say that's a totally different individual than Paul was before he was spirit filled. Right. The question is, do we just let Pentecost slide on by? Do we just let Pentecost, you know, be another event in the church and just go on away? Or do we really take seriously that God has sent the third member of the Godhead of the Trinity to come and indwell us and to be with us, to guide us in all truth? And, and here's a really awesome point, to be our comforter. To be with us when we're going through times of trouble and difficulty. To be with us when we don't understand why somebody else is acting the way they are. To be with us when we see wrongs and injustices and we can't change them ourselves. But we can cry over them. And we can break, let it break our hearts the way it breaks God's heart. Let's not put aside any cost too quickly. Let's not forget its importance. And let's not forget the third member of the Trinity. Now I want to be careful here. And, and, and there's always balance. And, and pastors are supposed to, you know, kind of balance things. Remember, Jesus said the Holy Spirit, what would he do? He would always point us to Jesus Christ. Always point us back to Jesus. Teach us about Jesus. Guide us in that. So whenever we're our theology, whenever we get to the point that we focus only on the Holy Spirit, we can get in trouble there too. But don't diminish the Holy Spirit. He has his rightful place <laughs> in God's plan of salvation, and it is important. And we best allow him to work in our hearts and our lives. There's a hymn I love. It's one that talks about the comforter has come, and talks about that aspect of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And as we close this morning, in closing, I'd just like us to sing it together. So I'm going to ask you to do something you haven't done in a while, and probably I should have earlier in the service. Some of you are getting a little sleepy, I understand. It is starting to warm up a little bit. But stand up with me, if you would, please. And let's sing together, The Comforter Has Come. The Comforter Has Come. As we close the service this morning.
Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your awesome, perfect plan of salvation that includes Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And we thank you for your Holy Spirit. We thank you for Pentecost, the birthday of the church, and the outpouring of your Holy Spirit upon us. Oh, Lord, might we just be obedient as the disciples. Wait before you until we know your power, your cleansing, your working in our lives that gives us a desire to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with others. Lord, again, we pray for our country today. We pray for everything that's going on, how we need you more than ever. Heal our land, I pray. And be with us as a church family until we can gather again. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen.